Society Tour, Stories Beneath the Stories of Lethbridge. My name is Belinda Croson and I'm with the Lethbridge Historical Society. I wish we could be doing this live, I wish you could be here with us, but of course with the restrictions right now that's not going to work so we're going to do a Facebook Live. I've been doing a few of these Facebook Live tours and one of the things I found easier is if I bring along a few people. So I have with me George Cool and Carol McGaugh of the Historical Society just so I can get some feedback from them. They might have questions as we go along might be the same questions that you have as well. Now I want just to sort of set some of the ground rules. Forgive me for some of the language I'm going to be using because I will be reading historic documents and they were not politically correct when they were written. So if I read some things that are not historic documents, just be aware of that. Please also ask any questions that you have. We'll try to get answers to them if we can. And know that this will be on our Facebook Live, but then we're putting it on the Historical Society YouTube channel at some point as well. So stories beneath the stories of Lethbridge. This is a walking tour of downtown Lethbridge, looking at some buildings and businesses connected with various cultural, ethnic groups of Lethbridge history. Uh, they, you have to remember when we do a tour, it's only snippets of stories. We will not be going in depth into some of these stories, but be aware that we have been doing a lot of research and you can always contact me later if you're looking for more information on any of these subjects. So we're standing here in front, actually I'm gonna go this way, of the Oliver Building. The Oliver Building is where we're going to tell our first story about the White Lunch Restaurant, the White Lunch Cafe. And it was operated by two Greek families for about 30, 40 years. Van Christu, Dr. Van Christu, who was a dentist in Lethbridge, associated with the university, etc., spoke and wrote about the Greek heritage of Lethbridge. He was Chris Christu's son, who was one of the owners of the White Lunch. And he put together a small amount of information about Greek immigration to Canada and to Lethbridge. Early in the 20th century, most families in Greece were struggling for survival during and following their prolonged war of independence against the Turks. Many of these families sent their best sons to America for a better future. A few of these men settled in Lethbridge between 1900 and the Second World War. Now, you have to realize this was written by one of the sons who came here, or by one of the sons of the men who came here. So, of course, he thinks only the best sons came. That might be a bit of a bias. But we certainly know that the men who did come here and the women who did come here had a lot of businesses around southern Alberta, and the White Lunch was one of them. Chris Christu was born in Greece and came to Lethbridge around 1907. He started the Maple Leaf Cafe, or sorry, the White Lunch Cafe shortly after he arrived. Over a few years, he decided to expand the business, adding on a banquet hall. Around that time, he took on a partner, A.A. Nikas. Nikas was also born in Greece, in Argos, Greece, and migrated to the United States in 1900. He lived in Chicago, California, and Washington State before coming to Canada. In Canada, he moved to Vancouver, Calgary, and then finally left for in 1911. Here, as I said, he went into partnership with Christu in the White Lunch Cafe that used to be operated there in the Oliver Building. A.A. Nikas passed away in the spring of 1944, and in 1946, the White Lunch was sold to Mr. and Mrs. David Ma and Mrs. E. Kwong, who redesigned it as the Club Cafe. Now, this was not the only Greek business or restaurant in Lethbridge. Some of the ones that operated as well were the Maple Leaf Confectionery, just over on 3rd Avenue South, operated by the Afghanis family. The Olympia Confectionery, which would have been actually across the street by Harry and Frank Christou. We also have the... Difficulty turning my pages. We have the Shasta Cafe by the Chrysolius family. The Roxy Hat Shop by the Skoulos and Bazinas families. Elite Cafe by the Height family, Empire Furniture by the Dangas family, and Boston Hat Works by the Miles family. All of those were Greek families who operated businesses mostly in the downtown area in the, from the early 1900s until 1950s and 60s. Now we're going to actually turn around and look across at the Henderson and Downer Block. Most of you would call it the Club Cigar Store, but it is originally the Henderson and Downer Block built in 1895. This building has had many different businesses, one of them being the Columbia Restaurant. Now the Columbia Restaurant would be oh, a little bit to the right of where Ria Salon is today. Now that business stands out in 1907 because it's the site of our Christmas Day riot. I'm going to tell the story as the Herald, as the newspaper told it at that time, and then we'll actually discuss it. So, I'm going to tell a couple of different versions and then we'll talk about which one you like better. So in 1907, it is Christmas Eve. 
a man named Harry Smith has been visiting a lot of restaurants in Lethbridge. He goes into the Columbia restaurant and gets into a fight with the Chinese waiter there. Another Chinese waiter comes to remove Harry Smith, hits him over the head with a hammer. Rumor gets around town that Harry Smith has been killed. The next day on Christmas Day, 500 men come down to this area of Lethbridge, completely destroy the Columbia restaurant, destroy a Chinese restaurant here in what was the Dallas Hotel, are looking to destroy other Chinese businesses and attack Chinese men in Lethbridge, when Mayor Galbert, the Mounted Police, the City Police all show up. Mayor Galbert reads the riot act and everybody goes home. Following the riot, only two people are ever charged with assault, and those are the two Chinese waiters who were accused of assaulting Harry Smith. Now that, in a synopsis way, is what we have in the Lethbridge Herald in 1908, 1907, 1908. But we have different versions of this, and one version tells a very different story, and it might answer some of the questions you have. One of the questions you might have is why was Harry Smith visiting so many restaurants on Christmas Eve? Well, this other one explains it. In fact, this other one is actually titled The Christmas the Cowboys in Lethbridge Want Berserk. Gives you a bit of an idea of what was happening on Christmas Day 1907. And in this version, Harry Smith is drunk. So as he goes to restaurants, he's getting into fights and getting kicked out, which is why he goes from restaurant to restaurant. When he finally comes to the Columbia restaurant, it is said he is so drunk he is shoot, shooting tomato cans off the wall of the restaurant. You can see why the waiters were trying to escort him out. I also could never understand why a waiter would have a hammer. I don't know about you, but when I go to restaurants, waiters tend not to have hammers. In this version, it's not a hammer, it's a knife, and it's not the pointed end. He uses the handle of the knife to get Harry Smith out of the restaurant. Okay? Your face was interesting there for a second. Yep. <laughs> In this one again, Harry Smith, everybody thinks he's dead. 500 people come down, start attacking the restaurant, start attacking Chinese residents of Lethbridge who are hiding in basements around the city. Mayor Galbraith comes down, the police come down, mounted police, city police, Mayor Galbraith reads the riot act. But one thing I could never understand in the Herald version was how easily the riot ended. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of a riot ending when the mayor just says, go home everybody. And in this version, it doesn't end nicely. The police actually have to bring in a wagon and they start arresting people and throwing people into the wagon. And they can't understand why so many people fit into the wagon until they realize that the poor driver in the front is trying to hold the horses and hold the people in the wagon and they're literally climbing out over him. So we have no idea if it's actually 500 people or 100 people each arrested five times. It's really hard to know what's going on. In this version, they finally get the riot under control and it gets it contained. And they actually go to the Columbia restaurant and they fix up the restaurant the best they can, apologize to the Chinese business owner, and then the riot is over. Two very different versions. Which one do you guys like the best, first or second? The second one. <laughs> Everybody likes the second one better. Which one is true, I honestly don't know. Probably the truth is somewhere in the middle, but we're not really sure because the second one was written 30 years after the event. And it was written by somebody who writes a lot of Lethbridge history, but we can't really trust. It was written by anonymous, who unfortunately does write a lot of our history. And we don't know if he chose to be anonymous because he was actually part of the 1907 riot and didn't want his name known, or if he made some of it up, but it does have a very different version. We have found multiple versions of it. In fact, and nobody from Lethbridge should be surprised, this even was written up in the New York Times, this riot. When Lethbridge says stupid things, we get international attention even in 1907. Some things never change. And so you can actually read the New York Times version of this as well. The one thing we don't have is there is no version of this in a written document that we've been able to find from the Chinese perspective. And that would be golden to have to actually get more perspectives of this. So if anybody is hiding a 1907 document about the riot in Lethbridge written from the Chinese perspective, call me because I want to see that very much. All right, we're going to go around the corner onto 3rd Avenue and talk about some businesses that were in the Whitney block and who C.E. Brower was. So let's go for a walk and turn the corner.
Wait, I'm not blinded, but you guys all are. <laughs> so we're standing in front of the Whitney Block. This building was built in 1907 and has had a large number of different businesses. But in the early part of the 1900s, one businessman, C.E. Brower, had a business here, actually a couple of businesses here, including a second-hand shop and a boarding house. Now, Charles Brower, C.E. Brower as he normally is in the records, wrote two letters to the editor that we've been able to find in the left of Charles. One he wrote by himself, and the other he wrote with his brother Lloyd Dennis, or L.D. Brower. And I'm going to read to you the beginning of that letter. Now, as I said earlier, please excuse some of the language I use. These are the words he wrote, and I want to say them in his words, but there are some words in here that may be a little offensive to people. Editor Harold, dear sir, a gentleman once asked me if I objected to being called a coon. I informed him it had been my good fortune to learn the proper names of the different nationalities and it countenanced far more intelligence, dignity, and good breeding to use the terms Italian, Swedish, Mexican, Chinese, etc. But if the term he mentioned represented the extent of his vocabulary, it would have to be accepted with tolerance. Now, the name of that letter I just wrote was called Dignity of Race. And as I said, it was submitted by C.E. Brower and his brother L.D. Brower to the Lethbridge Herald in 1909. As you may have guessed from that letter, C.E. and L.D. Brower were black men who'd moved up to Lethbridge from the United States around that time and had settled here for a short time in Lethbridge. Needless to say, they faced a lot of discrimination in Lethbridge during that time. Lloyd, L.D. Brower, was a CPR porter and many of the porters on the CPR at that time were black and a farmer who homesteaded by Bow Island with his wife and daughter. Charles C.E. Brower was an entrepreneur and businessman in Lethbridge in the early 20th century. He operated several businesses, including a boarding house that was here in the Whitney Block, a messenger service, so he had a bike messenger service that you could actually get messages sent out to different buildings around Lethbridge, and a second-hand store. The second-hand store was called the Lethbridge Exchange, and the boarding house had no other name except the boarding house they were at 411. Now, as a black entrepreneur in Lethbridge at that time, Brower also had several run-ins with the police. Now, one of the more interesting cases, and I do not have time to go into this completely, is related to an attempted murder case in Tabor, the Knox case. Brower is not involved with the actual attempted murder, but he gets involved when the accused wife, who is a friend of Brower's, approaches him to try to help her husband. And he gets accused of witness tampering. What the prosecution says is that he attempted to pay off the victim of the attempted murder to leave town. There is really good evidence that he actually paid the man to have a job here in Lethbridge so he would stay for the trial, but that wasn't believed by the judge and he was actually sent to the penitentiary for attempting to bribe a witness in the case. He returned to Lethbridge, but he didn't stay very long. Shortly after, Brower actually moves to Calgary, and after that I've lost track of him. I don't know where he goes. His brother Lloyd, who was homesteading in, in, as I said, in the Bow Island area, also disappears from the record. So I'm still trying to track down where the Browers went after Calgary. But the Browers are part of a research we've been doing on the black history of Lethbridge in southern Alberta. And right now we have about 70 names of people who were in southern Alberta from the 1870s till the 1940s. And as I said, uh, we don't have a lot of information, but we do have snippets. And it's interesting. Sorry, the car. That's when I do a tour down here all the time, the cars. <laughs> it's interesting to, when we read the stories, the various jobs people had and the um, connections they had. And when we get to one of our other stories, we'll see another connection of C.E. Brower there. But we're going to move to the corner where the courthouse stands today, it used to be the hot tamale parlor a cafe owned by a black woman entrepreneur. Got it.
That's why there's two of us. For <laughs> sore arms. If you uh, actually, I'm going to look that way. So I want to switch. Sure. So we're going to look at the courthouse. Make sure you're not in. There so you go. If you look at the courthouse, you'll see it's 320, 3rd uh, 4th Street South. But on this location used to be 318 3rd Avenue South. And it was the Hot Tamale Parlor. Now, I find it fascinating. I found two hot tamale restaurants in early Lethbridge history. I didn't know we were quite into hot tamales, but there were two. And the hot tamale parlor was actually owned by Ella Emma Dunn, who is most often called Miss Emma. As I mentioned earlier, she was a black entrepreneur, a black woman businesswoman in Lethbridge. Born in 1876 in the United States, according to the records I've been able to find, she came to Lethbridge in 1932 in the company of a doctor and his family. Safety in numbers, so if you move to a 
community where there are more people of your background, you can make sure that you are protected within the group. And secondly, there are often more economic opportunities in Calgary and, Leth and Edmonton than Lethbridge. One who did stay for several decades though was Cable Singh, and he farmed for several decades near Colvale before moving to BC to run a sawmill there. But as I said, the address of 415 3rd Street South was associated with Sehan Singh, about whom we know almost nothing except that in 1918, like so many others, he had a run-in with the police because of the liquor laws of prohibition. In July 1918, he and a customer Prohibition. Singh, the operator of the hot tamale place, was charged with keeping liquor for sale or barter and fined $150 in costs. Glenn Lomax was charged with drinking in public and was also fined. Now Glenn Lomax, don't let the name fool you, was a woman, she was a black woman, and she was a cousin of, or perhaps housekeeper to, C.E. Brower. So I haven't quite figured out the connection, but she's certainly either related to or in the employ of Charles Brower. So we see again connections within the community. We're now going to move into Chinatown, which means we've got to go a block north and a little bit over to the west. So come with me as we go down 4th Street without getting hit by cars. You guys haven't asked any questions. Say, say hi to Scott. Hi, Scott. <laughs> we actually have somebody listening. I'm watching. There's 77 people. Oh my heavens! Hi, everybody. <laughs> but Anybody so, have questions that we can see? Scott wants to know what we're whispering about. Yeah. Just yeah. testing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> we were testing the mic, but Scott's like, we can hear you whispering. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> we're gonna have to tell really good secrets. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, wait till we shut the camera off. That's when the secrets come out. Yeah. We're not gonna tell them what you guys are listening. No. Now there is something, well, interesting about Lethbridge in that we like to name <clears throat> same buildings by the same names. We have two Burns buildings in Lethbridge, 
We have two buildings that were the Coaldale Hotel, and we have two Kuang Sang buildings. But the two Kuang Sang buildings are actually telling us a story. The original Kuang Sang building is actually to the east of us, on the next block on the north side where the Antiques building is today. That is the original Kuang Sang. Kuang Sang was born in China in February of 1873 and came to Canada in 1905. Now, if he came to Canada in 1905, that means, of course, he paid the head tax. Originally at $50, later increased to $500. Anyone who immigrated from China to Canada during those years had to pay a head tax, and they were the only country forced to pay it. It's not known precisely when he came to Lethbridge, but by 1909, as I said, he was running a restaurant here on 2nd Avenue South, just north of where the fire station was. Actually, it would have been just north of where the city hall was at that time in 1909. He named his restaurant the Fashion Cafe. So within a year, he had moved his business and built a new Kuang Sang building here, one block further west, which also became known as the Kuang Sang building, and it's where he ran his business from. Now the second spot, which is actually a block further west, is also another block off the main business district. Fifth Street South, where we were with the Oliver Building and the Columbia Restaurant, that was Main Street in Lethbridge. That was the place where all the businesses that had priority were. So why would a good business person move his building a further block away from downtown a year after he had built very close to the business district? Well, it has to do, of course, with the fact that he was a Chinese businessman, and it has to do with that anti-Asian sentiment that we sort of talked about briefly when we were looking at the Columbia restaurant over on Fifth Street South. Throughout this time, we get growing anti-Asian sentiment against both the Japanese and the Chinese, though there are more Chinese in Lethbridge at that time than Japanese. Chinese start arriving in Lethbridge in the 1880s. Some will have come building the railway, some will have come for other work. Many will choose to stay, and when they do, they are limited in the jobs that they can do. They are limited to jobs like laundries, limited to restaurants, limited to, being, uh, to working in hotels and businesses like that. So many will run restaurants in Lethbridge. Over time, as more immigrants come, the anti-Asian sentiment starts to grow and it really does hit a fever right around the First World War. And what we see around 1910, around the time when Kwong Sang built this second building, is we actually see a development in what the city does. The city passes a bylaw, it's called Bylaw 83. And when you read the bylaw, it seems so incredibly innocuous. It is about making sure of public health and public safety, making sure laundries are in a certain place where water can be maintained and where any runoff can be addressed. But it very quickly becomes clear that it is about curtailing Chinese businesses in a certain area as much as possible. It becomes very clear that the Lethbridge Laundry, which was operated by white business people, is never required to move, but many of the Chinese businesses do. Not every Chinese business does. There are ones up on 13th Street North, um, there are other ones in other places, especially when people wanted them close and it depended on who your neighbors were. But many of the businesses will move between 4th Street and 2nd Street, between 3rd Avenue and 1st Avenue. So while we only have a few remaining of the Chinese businesses, we'd have been in an area at one time 100 years ago where many Chinese businesses would have operated, including the Kuang Sang restaurant here behind us, building behind us. It's also around this time, just as Kuang Sang moves, Joe Fong restaurant also moves. Joe Fong also had a very prominent spot. And this is Bug Truck Line. <laughs> okay, this is from the Bug Foot. <laughs> Add that in there. That's yeah. actually later in the tour. Don't worry, we're getting there. <laughs> no, after it happens. <laughs> Joe Fong was actually right on 5th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. Um, and he also moved over into this area at the 1st Avenue. In his case, the building that he was operating, where he was operating his restaurant, he was renting it. And it was purchased to be knocked down for the beautiful Bank of Commerce building one time. But when he was able to get... I think so. But when he did move, he had to move to First Avenue, which gave him a place here in... Chinese families as well, but a lot of single men 
either whose spouses were in China or who were unmarried living in this area. And as those gentlemen aged and passed away, a lot of that early Chinese history was lost with them. Now we're going to backtrack and we're going to stop at the Nakagawa store, which is a Japanese business in Chinatown, but we'll explain why. Develop at Raymond. Another group that we will see will come in 1907 through the work of the Canadian Pacific Railway through the CPR. They actually contract with the Japanese Immigration Supply Company to bring in a thousand laborers from Japan to help construct an irrigation system here in southern Alberta. Only 370 come to Alberta because of that anti Asian sentiment we were talking about earlier. Some will stay after the project to work for the CPR in other projects on railways and in the coal mines. One of the interesting things I noted, when the 1908 flood, we had a huge flood in 1908, it actually damaged some of the substructure of the high-level bridge as they were working on it. When that um, flood happened, it damaged railway buildings, I can't speak, railway bridges that were south of Lethbridge, the old CPR track, and they actually brought in a Japanese bridge crew and a Japanese railway crew from Port McLeod to work on that. So we know the CPR is quite actively involved in also bringing in Japanese labor. Around this time, the Hardyville Mine starts, and the Hardyville Mine, um, which was the Alberta Railway and Irrigation Company, was a gulf company, is bought out by the CPR, so it becomes a CPR company. So some of the Japanese workers over the CPR who have been working on irrigation projects and railway projects will now go into the CPR mine. And in 1909, we see something which is actually one of those news that actually makes international attention, which is kind of a good news story from Lethbridge really rare to have good news stories from Lethbridge go international, but this is one. <laughs> in 1909, the United Mine Workers of America, Local District 18, so the union for this local area, decided to permit Asian workers, primarily Japanese and Okinawan, to join the union. Now, they didn't do this out of the goodness of their hearts solely. Why they did it is if those men became part of the union, if there was ever a strike, the company couldn't use those men to work in the mines when the strikers were on strike. So. They didn't want those men to become scab workers for the mine companies, so they made them part of the union instead. And the tension this is, is this is the first, if not one of the first times, any union in Canada accepted Asian workers as part of their union. Now you'd think that would all be a good news story, but almost immediately a federal law is passed. And the federal law says that Asian workers can only work above ground at the collieries and cannot do jobs below ground in the mines. Now the best, the paying jobs were the mines jobs underground, which meant that the Japanese and Okinawa, Okinawan workers could work at the mines, but they had to do the heavy labor jobs above, la above ground, which paid much less. But through the mines at Hardyville, through the sugar beets at Raymond, we see by the 1920s quite large uh, Japanese and Okinawan populations in Raymond and Hardyville. Everything changes a bit more during the Second World War. As I'm sure many people who are listening know, during the Second World War, all Japanese Canadians were interned or relocated from BC by the Canadian and British Columbian governments. 
There were internment camps set up in D.C. and Ontario, but here in southern Alberta, about 2,500 Japanese Canadians, 70% of them citizens of Canada, were forcibly relocated to southern Alberta to work on the sugar beet farms. So they were actually sent out to farms around southern Alberta, and they made an agreement, and I hate this term, because it's not in bylaw. Even when they brought in the bylaw that segregated the Chinese, the Chinese took it to court and fought it. They lost, but they took it to court and fought it. So if you have a bylaw, if you have something actually written down, it can be challenged. This time they do something which in many ways is worse because it's more patronizing. They do what's called a gentleman's agreement. It's something that's not really written down, but everybody knows it's there and it's kind of applied as a law, but doesn't really exist. And under the gentleman's agreement, Japanese Canadians who were relocated to southern Alberta could not <laughs> live in Lethbridge. Also applied to Calgary, but in the Lethbridge area, they could not actually move into Lethbridge. They had to stay out in the farms. And this gentleman's agreement lasts till a few years after the Second World War. One of the people who challenges it is Rio Toro Nakagama. And he was relocated with his family from BC to southern Alberta. But starting in 1946, he began to lobby Lethbridge City Council and Lethbridge City to permit him to operate a business in Lethbridge. In 1947, he was finally granted permission to operate a business by getting a business license. And he opened Nakagama's Fish Market, one block further north at 312 First Avenue South. He was also given permission at that year to actually move into Lethbridge and reside here with his family. They operated the fish market over on 1st Avenue South till 1955 when they moved here to this store at 322 2nd Avenue South where Nakagamas under the next generation Ken has continued to this day. Now we got to go see what's happened at the Hungarian Hall. Isn't it nice it's also compact? but a upper class that was Anglo, British, Canadian, etc. They settled were near Galt Number no. 3, the coal mine, which became the village of Stafford or Staffordville. This was partly done because they were closer to work in that way, but it was also done so that they were separated from the community, and Staffordville actually became a separate community, had its own village, etc. until 1913, and it developed a very large Eastern Central European culture, Though, of course, there were English miners there, American miners there as well. But we do have a segregation happening with most of the Eastern European and Central Europeans living on the north side and more of the Anglo-British, American, Canadian on the south side. In 1901, we get a second wave of Hungarian immigration to Lethbridge uh, when a group of Hungarians come from Pennsylvania. Now, when they arrive, you have to realize, as, as we've been talking about different groups, as we talk about the concept of safety and number relying on each other, in 1901, the first Hungarian Sick Benefits uh, Society was formed. So they built this society that benefited each other, worked for each other, um, protected each other, helped when people were um, out of jobs, etc. And they actually had their own hall up on in North Lethbridge. Then that, that society starts in 1901. In 1920s, we get a third wave of immigrants coming from Hungary. Um, this is a group that is largely labor. A lot of them are going to work in the sugar beet fields and the mines. What a lot of people might not realize is the sugar beet fields and the mines are actually connected. 
because the sugar beet fields was summer work. You start in the spring, you work to fall. The mines tended to be winter work. You start in the fall, you work to spring. So quite often to have a full-time occupation, sugar beet labor and miners were often the same people with summer jobs and winter jobs. But a lot of the Hungarians who came in 1920 did work in the sugar beet fields. And immigration continues till 1929 when we get into the Great Depression and immigration virtually halts at that point. Then with this, you know, the first group, the 1800s, the second group, 1901, the 1920s, another group is formed in 1927. And that is the group that has this building here. It's the Lethbridge Hungarian Old Timers Club. It's formed in 1927. They don't have their own hall for many decades. They actually rent the first Hungarian Sick Benefit Society Hall for a long time. But in 1959, the Old Timers Club purchases a building here at 410 2nd Avenue South. And in 1960, the next year, they make renovations. 1964, they've got two different groups, the Hungarian community. And in 1964, the older one, the first Hungarian Sick Benefit Society, actually closes. And this becomes the major society for Hungarian residents of Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. And in 1979, they construct this building that we see today. Now, again, I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to use a derogatory term, but it's a derogatory term that sort of signaled a change, or the use of it in 1948 signaled a change. In 1948, Gulf Gardens, which is just above there, somebody, some person, drove a car over Gulf Gardens and, you know, knocked down plants and caused a great deal of damage. One of the city aldermen, Alderman Virtue, said that whomever did that must have been a bohunk. Now, that is a derogatory term and was recognized immediately as such. And Alderman Virtue was challenged by the... Um, by various groups, including the miners and the union, and he was asked to apologize for his words because of the derogatory nature. Now, I hope probably many of you have never heard that term, which is good. It's a term that should not be used, but it is a contempt contempt contemptuous term for an immigrant from Hungary and other related areas of Central and Eastern Europe, especially for laborers. And so in 1948, after being in Lethbridge for about 50, 60 years, we do start seeing some of those terms are challenged. We start seeing a change in the relationship between many people in Lethbridge. I actually have a 1938 employment list for the city of Lethbridge. And I'm not sure why, I've never been able to find out why, but they listed the nationality of every employee of the city of Lethbridge. And to say it was white would be an understatement. It was lily white and it was not very diverse. I think the diversity was being Irish and Italian. That was about the diversity of the um, staff in Lethbridge in 1938, but we start to see that changing in the 50s and 60s and moving on uh, with more people from Eastern Europe, Central Europe, etc., and more, hopefully, more diversity to come in Lethbridge as we go along. Now, uh, yes? We have a question about was the Miners Library also part of the Hungarian Hall? No, Miners Library was a separate, separate organization or starting back in the 1800s that was open to all miners as a um, started as a library, but also as a hall to um, have a drink, enjoy yourselves, etc. So that was a separate. Uh, the miners had lots of groups. There was a miners union hall, miners library, and it can get quite confusing, but those were separate organizations. I love when people ask questions. These guys ask me nothing. <laughs> so I want you to imagine 1960. It is four years after the Hungarian rebellion. And after the rebellion, we do see quite a large group of Hungarians moving to Canada. Unlike the first three waves of Hungarian immigrants, uh, this tends to be an educated urban group where many of the others have been farmers, laborers, etc. at least when they originally came. So they come here to southern Alberta and many are put to work in the sugar beet fields because that's sort of the deal. Come to Canada but you have to do two, three years of labor in the beet fields before you can move on. They're also used to much more loose European drinking, where you can drink outside and the rules aren't as strict. So when they come to southern Alberta, it is quite a shock to them. And an event happens here in November 1960 that brings that all sort of into focus. So there is a wedding and a dance happening here at the Hungarian Hall. And rumor gets around to the police that there is a fight occurring outside the hall. So the police respond, and when they get here, the fight is over, but they notice two men standing out on the sidewalk drinking. They have broken Canada Lethbridge's liquor laws, 
and so the police attempt to arrest them. Bystanders intervene, and a fight breaks out between about 50 people with another 200 bystanders and the police. Bricks, a glass, anything you can imagine is thrown. There's a big fight. Four vehicles are damaged, three of them being police vehicles. The police have to call in extra recruits. Uh, at the end, 13 people are arrested. 12 men and one woman actually served time following this riot. And the police only get the upper hand because they get help from two groups. The first group is the fire department, which is right next door. The fire department has water hoses, which they bring out and use for the police to benefit them, to help them. The other group are actually indigenous men who are here in the downtown and come to the support and aid of the police during the riot. Um, and that was a 1960 street crawl here on 2nd Avenue South. Now we're going to go to the corner. We're going to go right at, London, at the old Lethbridge Hotel and go find the Leo Singer building and talk about some Jewish businesses of Lethbridge. Linda, we have 93 people watching. Oh my goodness. People are bored. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Oh, we have got 90, 91 now. Oh, 91. Oh, that's yeah. rather good. So, Linda, we have a question as whether there were any East Indians around in the 1950s. Uh, I haven't, um, I haven't got a record, but I believe yes because well, some of them would have been working with the research station, etc., because there were exchanges between India and here. And so I would, I don't have names, but I would think yes, but can't prove it. I like to do pre-World War II history because everybody's dead and they can't sue me. I'm kidding. <laughs> like Cable Singh, who I mentioned the Sikh, I didn't, don't think he left until 53. the Leo Singer store and the next one progress are two of the Jewish businesses that have operated and do operate in Lethbridge. The first Jewish family in Lethbridge of whom we have information of whom we're aware was the Harris Goodman family who arrived in 1905 but enough Jewish residents will arrive shortly after that in 1911 the Jewish congregation in Lethbridge was able to start with 19 men listed as part of the congregation and as I mentioned there are several businesses and I won't be able to identify them all in Lethbridge operated by Lethbridge Jewish community, including this one here, that was the location of the Leo Singer store. Leo Singer was born in Romania and immigrated to Alberta with his mother, his father having been killed in the First World War. After his mother's remarriage, the family moved to Calgary, where Leo Singer attended school and later the Garber College. He came to Lethbridge in 1930, going into the retail clothing business. In time, he purchased Sterling Clothes that was located here at 214 Fifth Street South and renamed it the Leo Singer Clothing. His motto for his store was, it's not the sale that counts, it's the customers. And if you ever have a chance to talk to anybody who was a customer of the Leo Singer store, he seems to have stayed true to his motto because people love the store. Not only did he sell clothes to men and boys from across Southern Alberta, he was also known for supplying uniforms for various groups, including the Lethbridge City Police, Lethbridge Fire Department, Lethbridge Junior Band, and Scouts Canada in Southern Alberta. Beyond his business ventures, Singer was involved in more community groups than you can imagine. He was president of the Lethbridge Hebrew Congregation, chair of the Anti-Defamation League, a member of the University of Lethbridge Senate, a member of the Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce, associate with the United Way, 
a member of the Royal Canadian Legion and the Army, Navy and Air Force Club. He was a member of the Henderson Lake Golf Club, on the Queen Acres Kiwanis Club and with the Lethbridge JCs. In 1978, an oral history was done with Leo Singer and one of the things they asked him is why he moved to Lethbridge. And when he actually started his business in 1930, he actually was living in, Le in Calgary and actually was commuting back and forth. You have to remember 1930, we're in the Great Depression. And he actually commutes between the two communities for the first two years. It's not until 1932 that he finally decides to move to Lethbridge. And you might wonder, what would make a young business person leave Calgary and come to Lethbridge to stay, not only run his business? It was baseball, of all things. One of the reasons he decided to move to Lethbridge was to play for the Lethbridge Jewish Association baseball team. Le Leo Singer passed away in 1997 at the age of 83. The business, though, continued to operate until about 2001. His wife, Phyllis Singer, who he married in 1942, passed away in 2006. Now, if you remember earlier, I said that Joe Fong had a business here on Fifth Street that when they knocked the building down, he then moved on to First Avenue. This parking lot here is where Joe Fong's business would have been located in the building that was prior to the Bank of Commerce. And sadly, we also lost the Bank of Commerce building, which most of you know is one of my favorite buildings. It was that building that used to have Greek pillars, and it was an unbelievably gorgeous building that we lost in the 1960s. Don't blame me, I wasn't born yet. Actually, it was probably for Leo Singer's parking lot, but we won't mention that either. All right, let's go to progress. Progress this way. I think we're okay, Belinda. There is just one person having trouble, but oh. somebody's told her to close it and reopen it. was located at 114 Fifth Street South in the Begin Block. So that is the two-story building right beside us. It also noted that the proprietors were Morris Wex and Max Hoffman. By 1940, the Henderson Directory reported that Max Hoffman is the sole proprietor and he remained connected to the business until about 1954. In 1955, Henderson Directory, Cyril Serkin is noted as the proprietor of Progress Clothing. Other directories also connect Jack Klinger, Heim Serkin, Cyril Serkin, and Dave Serkin all with the store. It's the Serkin family, Father Heim and sons David and Cyril, who most people associate with Progress Clothing. In time, Progress would expand from the two-story building to the one-story building north of it, and the original address to the location become 112 Fifth Street South. Heim Serkin passed away in 1998 at the age of 90. He was predeceased by his wife Rebecca in 1997. Now these bare facts really cannot tell you all the stories about progress. There's many more to it. But one of the stories is this word. Now I'm gonna say a word that I hope anybody will understand except hopefully some of our viewers. We not. Now I spent about an hour talking to Blanche Brucehead last night to hope sure my pronunciation is right. 
So if you are a Blackfoot speaker, forgive me. I still have trouble with English occasionally. But Wienopsy is the Blackfoot name for progress. And Blanche also asked me not to um, tell you what it means. Can we just have confirmation? What is the name of the building behind where Belinda is currently standing? Okay, which one? The three-story or the two-story? The three-story or the two-story? <laughs> three-story is the Bentley building. Um, and it was uh, Harry Bentley where his store was. Zero Begin, or it's French Canadian, so Began, is the two-story, so it's Began Block and the Bentley Block. And you don't have to have a B name to be on this street, but it seems to help. <laughs> so Guinoxi is the name of progress in Blackfoot. In fact, when I've gone with Blanche and other Blackfoot speakers, it's amazing how many of the places downtown have Blackfoot names, because of course, they're, you know, in the language, there are names for them as well. And so we're going to go now to the very end of the block and talk a little bit about the Blackfoot history because that building has a connection that we want to talk about. building here at the very end of 5th Street, right across from Park Place Mall at the corner of 1st Avenue and 5th Street. And if you were hearing this as we're talking, I said there's a block with connection to this building. Everybody was trying to guess what it was, and there's several. This site here, this corner, was the first lot ever sold in Lethbridge when they moved the town site from the River Valley up top. This was the <laughs> first block sold. And in 1885, it was bought by IG Baker and Company, which was the company behind Fort Whoop Up. So, connection there that this is where I.G. Baker had their store. In 1891, I.G. Baker was bought out by the Hudson Bay Company and this site and this building was the Hudson Bay Company store until the 1930s when Hudson Bay left because of the depression. But there's another story to this building that I want to tell you about. Now the Blackwood history of Lethbridge of course is long but people living in Lethbridge is not as long in some respects because Southern Alberta was in so many ways a segregated community and in so many ways still is a segregated community. One of the things that you need to be aware of when we're studying the history of the area is the past system. For somebody, an adult, a chief, anybody to leave the reserve, they actually had to get a pass, permission from the Indian agent to even leave. And they had to say where they were going, how long they'd be gone and get permission to leave the reserve. That limited opportunities to live in Lethbridge and work on other jobs, etc. But because of it, we actually know who was in Lethbridge. So we actually have in the Glenbow Archives in Calgary, we have a list, and it's from 1928, 29, and 30, of everybody from the Blackfoot, from the Guy Nine, from the Reserve, who came into Lethbridge, and it tells us if they were shopping, if they were working, etc. And there are actually two lists. There's one list of just the people who came in for the day. And then there's a list of who was camping in Lethbridge. Because what we know from that list, and this list is only, I said two years, but this is decades, is there were Blackfoot camps, not in Lethbridge, but around Lethbridge. The camps were in the River Valley. There was a couple by the High Level Bridge, a couple by Highway 3 Bridge. There was a camp by um, Henderson Lake to work at the slaughterhouse there. There was a camp out by the Research Center to work for the Research Center and do jobs out there as well. And why we know about these camps, how we know, is that every week, under the orders from the Indian agent, the RCMP would go to the camp and write down everybody who was there and their purpose for being there. And that list was then sent to the Indian agent and we have a copy of that list. As I said, these camps were in the River Valley, Henderson Lake and there. Um, and so we know quite a bit of information about who was actually working in Lethbridge during those times. In the 1950s, the PASS system slowly starts to disappear. Discrimination does not disappear with the PASS system. And I have had several stories from elders of coming into Lethbridge in the 50s and 60s. And what they tell me gives you a very different sense of Lethbridge at that time. 
because once again they're camping in the river valley they're not really allowed to live in Lethbridge proper but they are camping in the river valley and what I have been told is there were certain businesses that had a good reputation and that you knew if you went to them you could get a job and the businesses I've been told were Marshall Auto Wreckers which was right by the Coolies which also um, Ellison Milling which was a little further east <coughs> the Stockyard and W.T. Hill. And what one of the things that connected those, those four buildings um, is they are either on the River Valley, on the Coolies, or along the railway track. Because the area of town that I've been told people were allowed was between 3rd Avenue and the railway, and between the Coolies and about 8th Street, so just on the other side of Gulf Gardens. Those are sort of areas people could go into. And those businesses that I said, the ones where they worked, you could walk down the railway track to get to them without having to go into the city proper and so it was an area people could go. Even within this area though, 3rd Avenue to the railway, the Coolies to 8th Street, I've been told by several people that if they were walking down the sidewalk and somebody else was coming towards them, it was always the indigenous person expected to get off the sidewalk and let the other people pass. So even in that area um, there was discrimination there as well. I also asked people, I said, so if you were in Lethbridge in the 50s and 60s, and you cross 3rd Avenue and you went down, you know, south of 3rd Avenue, what would happen? And everybody I talked to said very clearly, you would be escorted back to your area by the police. Mm -hmm. Even in the 1970s, when things start getting a little better, um, going into any store in Lethbridge, people would be watching you as if you were going to steal something, as if you were going to break something, as if you were going to do bad things. And so people were not always comfortable. Things do start changing in the 60s and 70s, never as much as we would like. The college and university, college starts in the 50s, university in and the 60s, start providing some opportunities. Um, some of the people who will come into Lethbridge are students, so we'll start seeing changes there. In 1962, the Lethbridge public school system and the uh, school on the Blood Reserve, on the Gainai Reserve, start carrying out negotiations for kids to come from the reserve to schools in Lethbridge. And another organization will start around that time, and that is the Lethbridge Friendship Centre. The Lethbridge Friendship Centre, now known as the Kogotogi Friendship Centre, starts in 1969 and actually opens its doors in June 1970, 50 years ago this month, in this very building here. So 50 years ago, Lethbridge Friendship Centre started in this building. Its opening ceremonies in 1970 are attended by 200 people, including the Mayor of Lethbridge, Mayor Andy Anderson. And he recognized the opening of the Friendship Center as a civic development in the city and noted that it was opened in the spirit of cooperation. Leroy Little Bear, who at that time was a director of the society, noted that the biggest problem is the misunderstanding between people. Sadly, many of the same issues they were discussing in 1970 were discussing today. Discrimination, misunderstanding, stereotypes, etc. Fifty years later, you know, I question how far we've actually come. Yes. There is a question that says, when you say camped in the 50s and 60s, what did that look like? Shacks, houses, teepees? Teepees were not permitted. It would have been tents. Um, and it would have been in a tent, not in a house. While there were people who lived in the River Valley in houses, um, if the black would have come in, it would have been considered temporary and they would have been there in tents. Uh, but teepees were, uh, from the earliest days, not permitted because of, how do I say this? It was taking something away that they thought important, so the government took it away. I don't know if I can explain that any other way. So here we now come to the end of our tour, and again, this will stay up on Facebook. If you have questions, and again, we'll later put it on our YouTube channel, please ask. Know that when I do a tour like this, it's only snippets. We actually have a research document on the black history. We're starting to put together a history of the Chinese community. We're trying to collect any documents that tell the history of the Blackfoot in Lethbridge. But we also know that many of you probably have stories and many of you might be better storytellers of some of these stories. So if you would like to see some of our research, if you'd like to connect with the Lethbridge Historical Society, please do. Uh, we know that, you know, I'm a document historian, I love my written stuff, but if you're an oral historian, there are people that would absolutely be wonderful to talk to to add to these stories and we'd love to work with you if possible. One of the reasons I do this research, one of the reasons the Historical Society does this research, we are as determined as we can be that nobody gets lost in our history, that these stories are kept, they are written down, they are maintained. So we are collectors, we're putting it together, but we would love to find even more storytellers who can help tell these stories. Reach out to us, you can get us through our Facebook page. 
If you really want to, we can use members and volunteers. We're a completely volunteer organization. Everything we do is volunteer time, and we would love you to join us. Keep in mind, we'll be doing more tours throughout this year. July 1st, 10 a.m., we'll be doing a guided historic walking tour of Henderson Lake. We were supposed to do it as part of Canada Day celebrations there. We'll instead be doing something like this, either taped in advance or virtual, so you can learn about Henderson Lake on July 1st. Linda Carlson saying good night, everybody. Any other questions? Oh, questions? Okay. Nope.